Hello and welcome to this exploring session and today we are looking at more Lord Mayor's shows. Uh, this time we are looking at 1616 and 1617. It is October the 29th, twice in one session. Um, and we are looking at two different uh, pageants uh, written by Anthony Monday first and then later on we get uh, another dose of Thomas Middleton. So we get two uh, competing playwrights uh, working in civic pageantry. Uh, later, a little later on I'll be bringing up uh, my, my little tube map of the, uh, uh, the route that these pageants take um, and it should uh, hopefully filter through if you've not watched any of these videos before. We have done quite a few now so we're working chronologically through uh, Lord Mayor's shows uh, now uh, to, from I say this this point towards the end uh so um we've uh, we've got a lot of stuff you can go back and have a look at uh if you have the time and uh, and enjoy what you're watching here uh so the uh broadly speaking it all kicks off in the morning on the 29th of october starts off around the guild hall heads down to the water the lord mayor goes off to be sworn in and then returns uh just a little below st paul's on the river uh wanders up to st paul's and then the the main body of the action occurs on Cheapside, walking back to the Guildhall, where food and things then occur. And then there's usually some additional bits and bobs as the Lord Mayor makes his way back to St Paul's. And then eventually, when he makes his way home, uh, how worse or where is a matter, of course, that history does not always tell us. Um, but as I say, we'll be bringing up a, a map to uh, get, uh, as we get to the pageant route uh, to uh, help fill in some of those, uh, those gaps. Uh, on on that. Uh, in the room today, we have this wonderful selection of readers who can be reading uh, some of the prose describing uh, the uh, the text, uh, as well as uh, the actual dialogue itself. Um, the way these things get printed uh, vary in terms of the amount of detail that we have, and we may uh, be able to supplement this with additional links to other materials that uh, you will find useful and interesting. Uh, so today we have Greg. Greg, if you'll introduce yourself, please. Please. I'm Greg and I'm, yeah, I'm a bit of a Lord Mayor's nerd now. Oh dear. He is a convert uh, of the truest kind. Uh, Eric, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Eric and I'm sitting in the dark. That's where he likes to be. Liza, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Liza and my cat assures me I'll be Lord Mayor one day. It, it will be true. Uh, Rachel, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rachel, actor in New Jersey. Looking forward to the Lord Mayor's show today. And Angela, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm a historian, so I'm used to revisiting the past twice. And Helen, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Helen. I'm another historian, and I'm out of my depth here because I'm not a, a Lord Mayor's show regular. And uh, uh, who is a regular and is often our fount of all knowledge. Uh, Tracy, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tracy, um, and yeah, I, I kind of do this sort of stuff a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's just written, 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 written books and things. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, and I'm your host, Robert Crichton, and I will be uh, generally uh, pushing this thing along. So as is uh, my want, I will ask Liza to read the, uh, the initial bump on the title page. Uh, what is this pageant for 1616, please? Chris Analea, the Golden Fishing, or Honor of Fishmongers, applauding the advancement of Mr. John Lemon, Alderman, to the dignity of Lord Mayor of London, taking his oath in the same authority at Westminster on Tuesday, being the 29th day of October 1616, performed in hearty love to him, and at the charges of his worthy brethren, the ancient and right worshipful company of fishmongers, devised and written by A.M., Citizen and Draper of London, printed at London by George Perslow, 1616. So before we get to uh, actual text, uh, uh, John uh, Lemon or Lehman, um, uh, which is it? Um, <laughs> if you want to get a laugh from an audience, you go with Lemon. If you don't, go with Lehman. Um, uh, what do we know about him and uh, what do we know about the, uh, the fishmongers? Well, you, you can have a lot of it if it's Lehman, actually, because as I think was mentioned last week, I think Liza mentioned it, Lehman means lover. Um, 
and, and Monday gets himself in his predictable pickle about this because he makes a big deal out of the fact that Lehman is unmarried. Um, real big deal out of it, actually, kind of embarrassingly so. Uh, I have no idea why. Um, but he was he was a good guy, really. He um, Because he was unmarried and didn't have any heirs, he left an awful lot of money to the city, um, to the Christ Hospital and to local parishes and so on and so forth. And there's a street named after him just outside Oldgate to this day. Oh, one of the good guys. Excellent. Uh, let's get into the text a little bit more. We uh, start with some Anthony Monday dedicatory material, I think. Is that how it's going? Let's see what happens. Uh, uh, Greg, if I could ask you to read on to uh, yours in uh, any service, Anthony Monday, please. To the right worshipful, judicious and truly generous gentleman, the master, wardens and assistants of the ancient and worthy company of fishmongers. It were a mighty injury, in my poor opinion, that you, being the main ocean, feeding all the rivulets of this painful employment, and directing the course of any current that, that way tending, should not receive the just retribution and duty which, by instinct of nature, all rivers else send duly to their nursing mother the sea. Therefore, gentlemen, I do but send you that which in right and equity belongs unto you, the patronage and the protection of this orphan child, begotten in your service, bred up hitherto by your favour and kind cherishing, and not despairing now to die though you're, through your want of regard. It is your own. Welcome it in love and acceptance, and I have as much as I desire, and will study hereafter to deserve. Yours in any service, Anthony Monday. That's an interesting uh, little, little little bit of text. Um, uh, protection of this orphan child. Um, is, I mean, is that autobiography? Was it? Wasn't he an orphan? Um, yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, he he's he was brought up under the care of the City of London um, after his parents died. So, so that it's 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 not wholly uh, obsequious um, arse licking as we sometimes have there. There was something actually quite 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 nice about that. I quite like mm. that. Um, I won't linger too much on that. Let's uh, let's get into the body of the text a bit more. Helen, could I ask you to read the first chunky paragraph coming? Uh, Angela, if you can read the one after, and then Eric, the one after that, please. I find it faithfully recorded in Authors of Reverend Antiquity that when Godfrey, Duke of Boulogne, being chosen general of the Christian army for freedom and deliverance of Jerusalem from Saladin, and all his other heathen miscreants. Every Christian kingdom did aid him with their best assistance, because it was a business to God's high honour and general comfort of poor distressed Christians. As from all other kingdoms, so from England, among other bands of worthy men, went the merchants, trading in fish, oil, flax, silk, and other commodities, most frequently then termed fishmongers, and the goldsmiths, then in a late begun league of love and enmity, by many friendly helps and furtherances to each other in divers dangerous adventures, as well on the seas as the land, no man being more forward in those affairs and in those times than they. After the most glorious victory obtained against the pagans and Jerusalem regained, they joined together in as glorious an action of helping to build the ruined wall again, from the water gate of comfort to the sheep gate of innocency or holiness. And so much the rather, because there was then much necessity of their pains and endeavor, not only by fishing and shipping to supply the daily wants of the soldiers, but also for bringing gold and silver thither for beautifying God's city and temple. And as this league of love and fellowship began upon so good an occasion, so they continued and declared it in England, Jerusalem, our famous metropolis, London, building the wall and two north gates therein, more gates and cripples gate, and as yet their arms and memories on them do sufficiently testify. The one performed by Thomas Faulkner, fishmonger, and the other by William Shaw Goldsmith. I'll ask Rachel if you'll read the next paragraph before we pause. Moreover, fish and oil, as well as gold, spices, silks, etc., 
were first brought in by those forenamed merchants, that the golden lamp might not want holy and precious oil, nor rich and ornate pearls, first found in shells by painful and industrious fishermen, fail to be set in jewels and rings of gold, as being the purest metal that the earth can afford, and hereupon honorable antiquity thought meet, to bestow such armory on them as, forever, might continue their brotherly affection. First, Peter Keyes, he being called from the condition of a poor fisherman to be the prime apostle, and those supposed keys the fishmongers bear in their ensigns of arms, not, super, not superstitiously anyway, but to declare an earnest zeal of entering into heaven's kingdom. Next, David's cup of saving health, which the goldsmiths also bear in their banners, so much briefly in approving their long continued love and amity. So this is uh, a bit of throat clearing uh, business uh, before we actually get to the uh, the connection with things uh, pageanty. Um, it, I, I always like it when people say uh, when people get a bit religious and they go, but not superstitiously, not superstitiously, i.e., not not Catholicy. Um, that that's that's the coding in that um, there. Uh, I, yes, it's always fascinating with that. A lot of interesting material there i'm not quite sure what to make of most of that I, I, um any any thoughts about all, uh, all of that material um that's come on eric i was gonna say that it's interesting how he didn't go yeah uh like last time in, in the previous pageants that we've seen where the um you know the intro usually goes and so in ancient greece they used to have fishmongers and the, the, we picked that up from the romans and then <laughs> you know it kind of it doesn't go that far back <laughs> No, it, it's sort of connecting things in a slightly more sideways way. Um, Helen. Um, I've just recently been looking at Haywood's Four Prentices of London, and where I was somewhat startled to discover that the Crusades were, the first Crusade was mostly uh, London Prentices with the Duke of Boulogne. Um, and lo and behold, it's here again. Hmm. Um, so obviously it was a thing, which yeah. I thought it was just an invention of Hayward. Yeah, uh, the question of historiosity of uh, any of these uh, elements um, uh, certainly seems to have currency at the time. Um, uh, Eric. Sorry, my brain just went, yeah, the brave lo uh, apprentices of London, yay! Uh, yes. It's just, uh, you know, the Pavlovian response now. <laughs> Yeah, head. after Edward Edward the um, Fourth, uh, that that's what we always do: is the brave apprentices of London and everybody. Right. Did it. Uh, <laughs> you, you you will remember from this sixteen eleven show that Monday mentioned the friendship between fishmongers and the goldsmiths, the other way round um, on that occasion. So he's kind of revisiting that here. So is there some kind of like set of London myths that emerge out of the companies that just keep on and on? And is there some place that they're held on to? I mean, is there a <laughs> You know, is, there, is there a book with all the London myths in it that they keep bringing up in this way? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, the big company histories will have the individual companies in-house myths, if you like. Um, I can't think of to offhand of something that gets them all. Uh, um, it's a really interesting idea. Mm, uh, Did Stowe have a go at them? Yeah, I was just thinking Stowe might be where the um, Geoffrey Boulogne thing, I mean, he when he says... All sorts of reverend antiquity, it could be kind of any of them really, um, but it might be Stowe, possibly without checking. Hall, maybe, Hall and Shed. Oh, yes, because Anthony Mundy was cross with Stowe because he put him wrong on something, hadn't he? So he definitely is getting some of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was actually working at this point, he would have been working on the second edition, the third edition rather than the survey, Mundy would have been. Mm. Uh, Rachel. No, I was just going to ask if anybody knew, are there people at this time who were in one of the Crusades that, you know, were still alive? Would they be seeing this or would this be like somebody's grandfather could have served in a crusade? And No, the Crusades are the 12th century. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's, so, so no, so, so they're plenty of time away for you to be able to make up myths. And of mm. course, it's important to leave out the Pope because uh, you don't want to do that anymore. Uh, so, so it's got to be interested to know when these myths really get got going. 
Mm. And also how they adjust over time, if there's data as to how they 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 get uh, accretions. Um, anyway, that's the throat clearing. Let's get to um, uh, closer to the the show itself. We will start getting information on that. So I will now work backwards. I'll ask Rachel to read. Uh, the next line and the next paragraph that follows it, uh, then Eric, then Angela, then Helen, and, uh, and then we'll see where we are. The reason of our present show, time having turned his yearly glass for election of a magistrate, a brother of the fishmonger society, coming by right of place and general suffrages of the citizens to the high dignity of Lord Mayor of this city for the year ensuing. Our devices for that solemn and jovial day where are where and are according proportioned by the discreet and well-advised judgment of the gentlemen thereto chosen and deputed in manner and form as followeth first therefore because fishing is the absolute emblem of our present intendment and fishmongers having been such worthy merchants in those reverend and authentic times leasing their matter of commerce and mar merchandise and aiming at their true hieroglyphical impress for the day's intended honor. Thus we marshal the order of proceeding. Our first device that ushers and leads the way is a very goodly and beautiful fishing bus called the Fishmongers Esperanza or Hope of London, being in her true old shape form and proportion, yet dispensed with all in some beauty for the day's honor. It may pass by general sufferance for the same fishing bus wherein St. Peter sat mending his nets. When his best master called him from that humble and lowly condition and made him a fisher of men. If not so, take her for one of those fishing buses which not only enricheth our kingdom with all variety of fish the sea can yield, but helpeth also in that kind all other lands Fishermen in this fishing bus are seriously at labour, drawing up their nets, laden with living fish, and bestowing them bountifully among the people. Next followeth a crowned dolphin, alluding some way to the Lord Mayor's coat of arms, but more properly to the companies, and therefore may serve indifferently for both. But because it is a fish inclined much by nature to music, Arian, a famous musician and poet, rideth on his back, being saved so from death, when robbers and pirates on the seas would maliciously have drowned him. Uh, Liza, if you'll take up the, uh, the next chunk. Then cometh the king of the Moors, gallantly mounted on a golden leopard, he hurling gold and silver every way about him. Before on either side and behind him ride fixed other his tributary kings on horseback, gorgeously attired in fair gilt armors and apt furniture thereto belonging. They carry ingots of gold and silver, each one his dart, and in this order they attend on him, showing thereby that the fishmongers are not unmindful of their combined brethren, the worthy company of goldsmiths, in this solemn day of triumph. Do I go on? Uh, I think no. Uh, 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 yeah, actually, yes, yes. Uh, carry on till the, uh, the, the end of that paragraph, please. We next present a singular emblem corresponding with the crest and cognizance of the Lord Mayor and bearing an especial morality beside, a lemon tree in full and ample form, richly laden with the fruit and flowers it beareth. Near to the stock or root thereof, a goodly pelican hath built her nest, with all her tender brood about her. And because her love and care, according to the opinion of Aristotle, Pliny, Jesner, and other diverse good writers, makes her extraordinarily jealous of them, as never daring to be absent from them, uh, the, subs the sustenance she receiveth from the male bird being insufficient for their nourishing, with her beak she lanceth her breast, and so supplieth that want with her own blood. Our cited authors variously affirm that this love and cherishing of them lasteth the space of a whole year, by which time they become strong and able for flight, and then, though they survive, the dam dieth. 
an excellent type of government in a magistrate who at his mere entrance into his year's office cometh becometh a nursing father of the family which though he bred not yet by his best endeavor he must labor to bring up if his love and delight be such to the commonwealth as that of the pelican to her young ones by broken sleeps daily and nightly cares that the very best harm should not happen to his charge that doth he justly answer to our emblem and as of her so of him it may be well said his breast and bowels of true zeal and affection are always open to feed and cherish them even with his best endeavor and diligence to be the expiration of his year and then though the main authority of government in him may be said to die yet it surviveth in other pelicans of the same brood and so it reaches to them in the same manner and because the lemon tree by the affirm and because the lemon tree by the affirmation of Julius Solinus Polyhister, Dioscorides Pomponius Mela, Petrus Mexius, and Antonius Vedarius, both in fruits, flowers, rind, pith, and juice, are admirable preservers of the senses in man, restoring, comforting, and relieving any the least decay in them. We seated the five senses about the tree in their best and liveliest representations as fitly jumping with our moral method. There I do think we need to pause. We have more devices to come, uh, but we've got four to discuss. Um, don't worry too much about where they live in the, the way the pageant is structured. Um, let's let's start with the last one there. Um, so, Lord Mayor and all of you, you are the bleeding pelican of of of, of givingness. And if you bleed, exsanguinate yourself to death, uh, other other Lord Mayors will. I, 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 I am I sort of overstating that point slightly. It um he really goes off on the run about this point, doesn't he? <laughs> it's 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 quite a. It's quite an important emblem, actually. There's a very famous portrait of Elizabeth I with the pelican brooch, I think, indicating exactly this kind of thing. It's, it's a secularised version of, um, oh God, some aspect of, of religion, Christianity, that I can't remember off the top of my head which bit. Uh, the, the nursing mother is Christ, the nursing mother. Yeah. Um, Christ nursing the children as well, the city or whatever else it is. There were some great statues of, of, of the Virgin Mary um, fountains with, with the water coming out of her breasts and so on. It was a big, you know, idea. Yeah. There's, there's a really nice pelican actually in um, St. Peter Cornhill. I think it's St. Peter, not St. Michael, um, just inside the lobby as you go in. Uh, any other thoughts on this? The lemon tree and pelican. It seems to be that this might be our um, tiered uh, pageant uh, setting because we got uh, the five senses are about their tree. Maybe it might not be. Um, uh, we'll see what other uh, structures are being used um, in the other devices. Uh, Liza. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure about the lemon tree. It seemed to come sort of out of left field. But then, of course, uh, it's. Uh, the Lord Mayor's surname is Lehman or Lemon. Um, and uh, also, uh, you can't really have fish without lemon. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and, and also, in fact, citrus, uh, citrus is a, a, a luxury in England at this time. Uh, citrus can be grown in Britain, but only under glass, uh, if you have an orangery or, or, or a greenhouse. Um, which not many people do at this stage. Uh, so so uh, fresh lemons are, are a, a good commodity. Mm. Uh, Rachel. Um, no, I was just gonna ask, like the, Liza went into it, but I was just gonna ask, did, is the lemon tree for scurvy? Like, that's what I thought before she went into that. I, is, that a, is that how they know, are, have people tackled scurvy yet? I don't even know. Uh, no, I think that's, uh, we've got another couple hundred. Helen, Helen knows, Helen. Uh, Helen. Uh, bizarrely enough, yes, by this time, practically, the uh, shipmasters did know about citrus fruits and scurvy, but it was another couple of hundred years before the Admiralty accepted it. So it was practically, it was, it was already being done, but uh, it wasn't a general practice or approved 
bureaucracy being what it is. Um, uh, so we've got uh, three other uh, devices going on here. Um, we got King of the Moors on a Golden Leopard. Um, did we have that last year or the year before? It, it, it feels like that's not been that long since we had a, uh, a Golden Leopard with the King of Moors. 16, uh, 15. 15, so, so it is- 13. Oh, 13. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had it for three years. So that, that seems reasonable. That's, that's all right. Um, uh, and I'm sure- I'm we'll, sure as I can be the Fishmonger's Esperanza or the Hope of London is also Jason Zargo. From two years previously, well, or we, one year previously. Well, yeah, we've got um, uh, the, the 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 ship. Uh, I think it's the, the it's fair to say there's there's a base thing that gets uh, of a ship that gets uh, re reused several times, and so they they simply change how it's decorated. That seems to be the practical way that that works because I think we've had that a few, uh, couple of times at least uh, in the last few years as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so we started off with a a, a, a ship. Uh, then we had a crowned dolphin. I can't remember. Well, I, I say I haven't done my spreadsheet of uh, of uh, reused uh, properties, but we've had a dolphin before, surely. Um, yeah, didn't we have one in the last one where it was all about the sort of um, sea creatures, and then suddenly we got Robin Hood. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. That, yeah, a dolphin might have been as 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 long ago as last year. Um, <laughs> But hey, maybe it was popular. And, you know, it is the fishmongers. It sort of makes sense. Um, any additional thoughts about any of those uh, those particular devices that we've got? We've got, I say, four separate devices. Admittedly, two of them are probably just people on horseback or on some kind of uh, single uh, uh, device rather than uh, the rather complicated boat slash uh, lemon tree uh, stand. Angela. Oh. It's just that um, I remember um, Rachel being thrilled that the idea of sweets being thrown out to the crowd, you know, it's possible that the golden ones are, but in fact, fish is being thrown out to the crowd. We seem to have missed this. Mm. So, you know, oh my God, live fish. <laughs> yeah. so they're pulling in live fish and then distributing them, you know, to the, to the assembled crowd. Bestowing <laughs> them bountifully among the people. Uh, <laughs> whether they want it, or not fish in the face <laughs> that would probably be thought of as a good thing you know in, mm. in in this period in london somebody giving you free food like that i don't know but i kind of wonder what it might be would it be shellfish or you know real fish what's coming out of the the, the, the illustration i'm looking at the pageant scroll right scroll right now and actually it's in the same order as well as the text which is interesting but the illustration clearly shows they're throwing fish <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when you or trout, uh, you know, is it a pike? <laughs> when when you mentioned um, shellfish, I just had this <laughs> had this vision of of people in their Sunday best try or their their festival best trying to catch a squid or something as it comes out of the air. <laughs> in my mind, it's mackerel. Mm. Ooh, smelly. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think they're quite small fish, so it's possible. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, fish, fish in the face from the, uh, the ship. Um, <laughs> dolphin, king of the moors, uh, riding a, a golden leopard, and and I say a lemon tree and a pelican. Uh, so uh, with a lot of referencing Pliny, uh, always always nice when people reference Pliny. Uh, always like that. Any additional thoughts before we go into the other devices? Before we get to some dialogue. Um, no. Okay. So I'll work in reverse order to last time. Greg and Liza up uh, next, please. So Greg first and then uh, Liza. Our next device, before it be marshaled in due rank and order, is a goodly bower shaped in the form of a flowery arbour and adorned with all the scutcheons of arms of so many worthy men as having been Lord Mayor's the Fishmongers Company and each man's name truly set down on them. It is appointed first to stand in Paul's churchyard, and at such a place as is thought most convenient. In this bower is a fair tomb, whereon in armour lieth the imaginary body of Sir William Walworth, sometime twice Lord Mayor of London, and a famous brother of the Fishmongers Company. The reason that his conceit aimed at that tempestuous and troublesome reign of King Richard II and the fourth year of his reign, whose life, crown and dignity, next under God's omnipotent power, were manfully defended and preserved by that worthy man, Woolworth. 
Suppose his marble statue, after the manner of knightly burial, to lie upon the tomb, and both it and the bower to be worthily attended by those five knights in armor, and mounted on horseback that were knighted with Sir William in the field after he had slain the proud insulting rebel, captain and ringleader to all the rest. Six trumpeters, well mounted and appointed, with trumpet banners of the company's arms, and a gallant guard of halberdiers being twenty-four in number with watchet silk coats, having the fishmonger's arms on the breast, Sir William Walworth's on the back, and the city's on the left arm, white hats and feathers, and goodly halberds in their arms. These likewise have their rank and place near to the tomb and bower. London's genius, a comely youth attired in the shape of an angel, with a golden crown on his head, golden wings at his back, bearing a golden wand in his hand, sits mounted on horseback by the bower, with an officer at arms bearing the rebel's head on Walworth's dagger. So soon as the Lord Mayor is come near and way made for his better attention, the genius speaketh, the trumpets sound their several sudden flourishes, Walworth ariseth and is conveyed on horseback from the bower, as you may better perceive by the speeches apted for the purpose. The bower and tomb are likewise borne along before him for his more convenient return to rest again. Well, that's, com that's considerate, isn't it? You know, when you've got a corpse uh, making speeches, it's important to make sure that the, you bring his resting place along for the ride. So this particular chunk is uh, starting in uh, Paul's churchyard and is going to be the primary driver of the pageant by the looks of it as it travels along uh in uh, uh, uh cheapside so um we have various characters here we've got woolworth the uh the slayer of uh, of jack straw uh et al and uh, we've got trumpeters for that we've got uh london's genius a comely youth on a uh, uh, uh on a horse um as well and uh, yeah, rebel head on uh, Woolworth's dagger. So uh, officer at arms gets to carry that. Um, so, uh, and then uh, that's, uh, we're gonna get more data on that as we are gonna get speeches specifically relating to this pageant uh, later on in the text. Uh, any thoughts about that before we move on? Uh, Eric. I'm just wondering whether they, because obviously there were references to the goldsmiths and how much gold is being thrown around, both in like the design and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm just wondering whether the goldsmiths actually helped finance this <laughs> alongside the fishmongers. I think the fishmongers were able to at least uh, uh, source the fish. Um, so, you know, that's yeah, no, one. That, 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 that wouldn't have happened. No. Um, they're usually quite careful to point out that nobody but the members of the company in question actually paid for things. Um, we've got more repetition here, of course, a couple of people noticed in the chat, you know, this is another person rising from, from death to, you know, we had Farring, didn't we, in 1611. Um, and then I think there's another one last year, wasn't there? Um, yeah. I should, um... really yeah it's uh it, it, there is that danger of us uh i i i do intend to have a a handy spreadsheet so that we can uh, we can uh, nip into the repetitions because they they will start all blurring into one um so uh, a handy cheat sheet will be available coming soon um rachel um no i was just gonna ask a little more about what um the relationship between the fishmongers and the goldsmiths are is it like what like the what is the mythology of the relationship and then also what is um what is like the reality is it like back then in london was it like um in new england in america where your your average person would buy a piece of a ship and then they'd have uh like the right to some of the the profits that would be made when the ship returned is, is that supposed to be can, um, um, yeah, what is the relationship between them, if anybody knows? I'm not. I'm not sure where it. Oh god, my day. No, I'm not sure where it comes from actually, but it's it's certainly a thing. Uh, if that helps at all, um, it well, might have something to do with the crusades possibly... together. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know, Rachel. Sorry, I was, it's something. Yeah, that I've just take, take sort of taken as read, but yeah, I should really know about it. 
Um, but that is how, you, you know, ships, you could buy parts of ships. So you could absolutely have shares in a ship. You could also, you know, sort of like put goods on a ship. But then that would be true of any trader, not just uh, goldsmiths traders. So uh, this is this is one for Tracy. She's got to work this one out. <laughs> I'm just checking, I was cheating on checking stone surveys if I can find <laughs> um, but I'm taking it that it went the other way. So when the goldsmiths had their procession, there was a, a, a nod to the fish mongers as their besties. Yeah. Yeah, there there was. a special relationship. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 maybe there is no actual material. Uh, it's just yeah. it's just a convention. But so often these special relationships are terribly important on one side and the other side don't know they exist. Mm. But this one was mutual. It was definitely reciprocated, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a funny one, really. I'm just seeing there's no... Where are they in the hierarchy? Uh, we do. have to ask Robert Titler. He'll know. He'll pop a message somewhere. Where he may he... know, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ask him. We'll, we'll um, leave that one to run in the background, if uh, yeah. uh, if I may. We'll get we've got a little more data to get before we get to the speeches. So I so say this this text sort of uh, dances around its ordering, as it were, in the sense that uh, we get all the order of business in prose, and then we get the speeches uh, that fit have been described previously uh, are all, all come out together. So we've got one more element of this uh, uh, pageant in the next two paragraphs. I'll ask. Um, Helen and then Rachel to read the next two, please. We come now to our last invention in this our triumphal progress, memorizing London's great day of deliverance and the fishmonger's fame forever. In the year 1381 and on Corpus Christi Day in West Smithfield, where the like number of rebels, rebels as then were never assembled leaving the matter a case of desperate rebellion, the manner a most base and barbarous kind of proceeding to the great disturbance of the king and state and unavoidable ruin of this city, but for the good angel of defense then guarding it and the worthy Lord Mayor made the second instrument. Let us imagine, though not in the magnificent form as then it was done, Yet according to our compass of performance, that whatsoever hath formerly been said concerning Walworth's reviving at the tomb, his royal attending, and the beautiful monument following, is all but a shadow of that triumphant victory in our aptest illusion. Our pageant chariot is drawn by two mermen and two mermaids as being the supporters to the company's of, of the, to the company's coat of arms, in the highest seat of eminence sits the triumphing angel, who that day smote the enemy by Walworth's hand and laid all his proud presuming in the dust. With one hand, King Richard sitting in a degree beneath her, she holds his crown on fast, that neither foreign hostility nor homebred treachery should ever more shake it. In the other hand, he holds his striking rod inferring thus much thereby, by me kings reign and their enemies are scattered. All the forefront is beautified with royal virtues as truth, virtue, honor, temperance, fortitude, zeal, equity, conscience, beating down treason and mute, mutiny. Behind and on the sides sits justice, authority, law, vigilancy, peace, plenty and discipline as best props and pillars to any kingly estate. These, as all the rest, are best observed by their several emblems and properties borne by each one and their adornments answerable to them in the like manner. So uh, maybe this is more like the tiered structure that we've uh, discussed in previous uh, uh, occasions. We've got this chariot being led by mere men and mare, uh, maids. I forget how many times we've had Mayor men, we've we've definitely had at least once, maybe twice. Um, uh, I don't know if they were pulling chariots uh, or whether they were individuals. Uh, and then we have this uh, this selection of uh, uh, royal virtues and uh, and uh, stacking up to uh, uh, this angel and 
and Richard and and, and Woolworth et al. Uh, so um, yeah, it's an interesting structure, which again is probably one of the big highlights that moves along. Uh, and there may be speeches associated with that later in the do document. Uh, we shall see. The, um, um, the, the patent scroll, scroll rather shows chains between the merman and mermaid and the pageant the chariot of Richard II. So it looks like they were actually, they were connected, you, you know, they kind of connected to each other and mm. one preceded the other. So there's a certain amount of, of information on these images about how the whole thing was kind of conveyed around the city. Yeah. Excellent. Um, other thoughts? You said clicking away. Uh, Angela. It's a question, really. Are these all children? You know, because mermen, that's one thing, but mermaids, I mean, we're expecting them to be semi-naked. So how, how do they manage all that? Because I assume they're not using women. <sighs> they were almost definitely children for the kind of, where you've got a large number of, of figures on one particular pageant device. Um, I'm looking at the, the merman and mermaid, the merman and mermaid, there's only one of each actually in the illustrations. They are indeed topless. Um, they might well have just been carved, actually, rather than being people, because they've got the whole tail thing and it's quite elaborate looking, and it looks a lot more like it would have been carved. Mm. That'll get you out of trouble. <laughs> mm. Yes. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's an excellent question because uh, some of the speeches, um, especially the sort of opening and uh, remarks to the Lord Mayor, for example, if he's getting on, on, on the barge at the beginning uh, or, or, or in other parts, seem to be designed for full-throated adult performers. Uh, but then a lot of these pageants are clearly designed for smaller people who's, uh, who, who are perhaps more cute uh, than voluminous, uh, so uh, there, there, there is the potential for both um, uh, ac uh, across. But we've definitely got references to you know the the boys who are, who are used uh, you know from balls and things. So we've had we have had that in previous ones. Uh, Liza, then Rachel. Yes, uh, I have to beg the company's pardon for a, a misreading earlier, which I wouldn't bring up except it comes back. Um, uh, the, the, there was a reference earlier on to certain trumpets, and I misread it as sudden because I thought it was a typo. But no, uh, they, they're mentioned uh, in the flourishes that come up, and uh, certain is um, muted, I think, with a, a mute in the, in the barrel that makes the, yes, sourdain or sourdine, uh, that makes the trumpet uh, make a very different noise. Uh, and sound as though they were far away. And some, some of them are marked with certains and some of them are marked without. So but the trumpeters are having to make both noises. I, try, I tried to get a word in the um, OED quite a few years ago now, and this, they said they needed more, inch, more examples of it, but I'm gonna try again. <laughs> I had to try, I, had to, I actually had to go and look, because I was gonna try and put it as sudden. <laughs> I was going, because that's how it looked when I, um initially did this, I thought, oh dear. It, yeah. Indeed, it looks like certain is uh, is a noun. It's the object that you put in the bell of the trumpet, the, the mute, as, as a trumpeter now would say. Mm. Uh, Rachel? Um, no, I was just going to say um, uh, what Tracy was saying about how that they might be carved. They say as best props and pillars, so maybe that's a little, a little uh, you know, play on play on it that they're literally like props in the thing that they've set up, um, and then also just the how how they this is kind of like similar like the way that they set up in this paragraph this one um, chariot it does seem really similar to the the way the goldsmiths uh, had theirs like how they had truth show up and and talk. Mm. Okay, we're now going to rattle through relatively pacely, actually, through all the dialogue. So bear in mind the relative order of service, um, and I will in, occasionally in between uh, throw in uh, hopefully some sense of where we are. Um, I'm going to ask Angela to read the next uh, 
general uh, paragraph coming up. We're going to get a reference to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, upon the water uh, material. So um, there's uh, there's stuff that may have uh, been presented as they were getting onto barges at the top of the show, which we haven't had no real reference to uh, at the first part of the of the day. But broadly speaking, what we're going to be looking at is text relating to. Uh, Woolworth and uh, London's genius uh, at St Paul's Churchyard uh, and then the progression thereupon um, uh, across uh, across the town. So I'll ask Eric if you can be London's genius please. I'll ask Greg to be uh, Sir William Woolworth and, um, and uh, I'll read in uh, intervening little bits of text and uh, be occasional trumpeter. But I'll ask Angela if you can uh, Start us off, please, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the last bit of prose of any length. Having thus briefly described the order of the day's service, insomuch as appertaineth to my charge and place, not omitting the fishing bus, dolphin, merman, and mermaid upon the water first, and afterward marshalled in such form as you have heard on land, we come to set down the speeches according as they are appointed to be spoken, beginning first at the bower and tomb in Paul's churchyard after my Lord's return from Westminster, where the city's genius thus beginneth. Uh, London's genius at the bower and tomb in Paul's churchyard. By virtue of this powerful wand, which in a minute can command graves, vaults, and deeps yield up their dead, how late or long time buried, Thou image of that worthy man that London's knighthood first began in office of the mailty, a high and graceful dignity, though thou yet thou, though yet thou sleep'st in the shade of death, by me take power of life and breath. Here the genius strikes on him with his wand, whereat he begins to stir, and coming off the tomb looks strangely about him. <laughs> That was my attempt to do the muted, the first sound of certain trumpets. London's genius gives thee leave, an airy substance to receive. Speech like the spirits raised from rest, triumphs and pleasures to digest by power of sacred poesy. The second sound. And seeing this day's solemnity honours thine own society of fishmongers, a worthy band, famed both the city and the land, by rare deed of royal loyalty upon the king's proud enemy sir william walworth do what may remain in thee to crown this day with general fullness of content and that was a full flourish without certains for thereto all our hopes are bent so william walworth standing before the tomb and doing reverence to the genius speaks this speech he that above two hundred years, free from disturbance, cares and fears, have silently slept and raised this day to do what graceful help I may onto that worthy band, sorry, onto that band of worthy men that were and are my brethren. And you, great fathers of this state, which I myself did propagate twice as Lord Mayor, oh, yet to see this ancient famous dignity flourish so fairly and as then, blessed with as wise and worthy men, moves tears of joys and bid me call, he, here he doth reverence to the all. And he does indeed do reverence to the all. God's benison light on you all, you, your character, office and place, while what I, by that sword and mace, with such a difference as before, this day once happened and no more. The genius speaks you in mine ear, a maiden man, a bachelor, you being the second, let me say, this is a blessed marriage day of you to that great dignity of your dread sovereign's deputy. No doubt, but your chaste thoughts and life will be as chaste to such a wife. All happy blessings crown, I pray, London's and Lehman's wedding day. And there is another full flourish, which I'll let you leave to your imagination. <laughs> Observing that fair livery, you are of mine own company. How can I then but joy to see such eminence and high degree grace still our grave society? And see, my lord, this bower relates how many famous magistrates from the fishmonger's ancient name successfully to honour came in London's mayority. 
these fair coats, their several arms and title notes. Turk, Lovekin, Roth, Pesci, Morden, these before me were everyone. Then I, next, Exton, Ascom, Faulkner, Mikkel, Panesis, Panis, sorry, Reinwall, Foster, Hunin, Hampton, Ostrich, Remington, Nelsworth, Coppinger. These being gone, succeeded Amcoats, Curtis, a lot, and now John Lehman, who will I what? Welcome as any to this place with our kind brethren's love and grace. Alderman, we had many more that never this high office bore, and therefore are not ranked here, but only as such Lord Mayors were. The genius, as charming him again with his wand, proceedeth thus. Walworth, here stay. We may do wrong and hold this worthy man too long from great states that at this feast are wel everyone welcome a guest. Uh, are everyone a welcome guest. Those aldermen that on the day when the proud rebel thou didst slay were knighted with thee in the field are raised by me their love to yield with this fair guard and tend on thee in so honoring this solemnity. Mount then thy courser that we may in the remainder of this day do more than time will now afford. Set on then, honorable Lord. And we'll pause there. So yes, uh, Walworth gets on his horse and the procession uh, makes its way along Cheapside to the Guildhall for uh, food and drink and, uh, and much solemnity. Uh, we have a little more text to come in a moment, but yes, so those, that's the dialogue we have. This is all at, uh, I say, at St. Paul's uh, Churchyard and say, uh, uh, before it sort of uh, everything makes its way. This seems to be much more a, a demonstrative pageant. There's an awful lot of devices and visual things, but very little dialogue or at least that's been reported and I did wonder um, because of the way these things are actually commissioned you know that the author and, and, and production team effectively pitch to the uh, the livery companies the show they're going to do you know that this feels a lot of this feels like a pitch document than rather than a, 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 a sort of final thing I, I don't know whether I'm being is that right is that a fair descriptor for it because it's when they sort of as they're appointed to be spoken it feels very much like a bit this is stuff from before it all comes together I, th I think there, there are always elements of that in in all of these and some of them it's more obvious than others really Decker's particularly prone to do that um yeah I mean the images um were it, there's, there's an inscription on them and clearly they were drawn up for a kind of permanent memorial of the event um, it was quite a lavish one, so and the fishmongers hadn't had a Lord Mayor for quite a long time, so that might have been they were really sort of pushing the boat out for this one. Mm. Uh, Eliza, yeah, and and of course, um, when you get them printed, uh, I, I guess uh, you'll sell more copies if they can be released on the day of the pageant, uh, or or shortly thereafter. So. What goes to press is of necessity going to have to be a pretty early draft, right? Mm, what's the turnaround for a printing press? Anyone in the room know? There, there isn't any evidence they were actually sold. Um, we know in lots of cases how many copies were printed. Um, this one survives in larger numbers than any of the others, actually. There, there, there are copies of this particular pageant book all over the world. Um, and it's quite collected, which is kind of interesting. Um, clearly, people kind of collectors of printed um, drama text from this period saw it as a kind of a, you know, a good example of the genre, perhaps. Um, I mean, it, it but our best guess is they were handed out on the day. I mean, it, it depends a bit how much money people want to put behind it. So if they are, if they're sponsored, you know, um, printings, then it's up to the people sponsoring it how many they want printed and then what they're going to do with it. And sometimes printers sneakily sold some as well uh, if they weren't getting their money back. But I'm assuming that the fishmongers like to pay their bills. So uh, so it could be down, down to, I mean, Parliament, for example, never did pay their bills. And so printers were constantly giving away the stuff that, you know, selling the stuff they were supposed to be doing just for Parliament. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, okay. it's quite interesting. This one, this one, 200 copies additional copies were were paid for by the company so um yeah that that sort of com that sort of confirms my sense that this one was very well disseminated mm. 
and the but fact they have, have... hardly ever had print uh, publishers involved. They're nearly all just straight from the print. It's from the company to the printer, and then to the people, the recipients. Mm. Uh, and the fact we've also got uh, uh, lots of you know the visual documentation as well. You know, there's 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 uh, there's a, a lot of material. Clearly, interest in this on some level. Uh, Liza. Yeah, um, just uh, just noting that I love the genius charming Walworth to silence in mid-speech with his wand and saying, no, you've gone on a bit too long. Um, uh, and it's time to get on the horse now. <laughs> I, uh, just, um, you know, they, they, bring, they bring this guy all the way back to life in a very reverent manner. And then they're like, nope, shut up. <laughs> Uh, Eric, I was quite interested that the rhyme and the the, the, the well, I don't know, sentences or whatever you want to call them, phrases are much shorter than we're used to. Uh, I don't know if that's just because like um, other times there was more to say, <laughs> but it feels like this one is just like is easier to speak and rhyme rather than sort of previous pageants that we've looked at. Uh, I think it's fairly comparable with the last one we looked at. Maybe not less so the the, the one before. Um, you know, the, this is good outdoor speaking territory. Uh, there, there's been tetrameter in the last two pageants, definitely, and um, the, a lot of tetrameter was used in the first of the two in a row Drapers pageants of the past two years, uh, and that and that one was used because I think partly. Uh, because tetrameter is often used in Middle English verse, and and also uh, and uh, it, I think it might have been a, a textual or metrical harking back to the good old era of of old England, um, which uh, which was also very much the theme of that that first Draper's pageant. Um, but as Rob says, the shorter lines do make it easier to speak outdoors and easier to breathe for. And perhaps Monday has got quite used to writing tetrameter now and likes it. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if there's a, the, there is a, a, a fundamental difference between some of the playwrights writing uh, civic pageantry and what, what Monday actually does and what some of the other earlier pageants do. Uh, I think that's, that's a question really to do proper comparison later on, but it, it does feel... Um, you know the the Monday really does know know his his onions for what 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 could be heard and has a chance. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of possibilities there. Uh, we're going to go to the the last chunk of text. I think we're going to swap round our William Woolworth because uh, the, the the next speech uh, uh, we may even pause mid speech because um, there's uh, it's it's quite a long one. Oh no, we swap Woolworths anyway, so that's all right. So Helen, could you be Sir William Woolworth? And I'll ask uh, Liza, can you be Sir Simon? Uh, coming up. Uh, so in the afternoon, when the Lord Mayor returneth to Paul's, so they've all gone to the Guildhall, they've had a, uh, a do. They're now returning to Paul's, so they're heading back along Cheapside. Uh, all the devices being aptly placed in order near to the little conduit. So hopefully you can see on my little map, um, they've, they've made their way uh, down most of the street. Uh, they are by Sir William Walworth described to him in this manner. So if anyone hasn't understood what all the pageants mean, uh, this hopefully will be a wonderful explication. Now, worthy Lord, there is imposed on me a brief narration of each several show provided for this triumph, as you see, in order to describe them as they go. This fishing bus instructs you first to know the toilsome travel of poor fishermen, subject to all weathers, where and when, in stormy tempests they admit no pain to bless all lands with sea's bounteous store. Their labour doth return rich golden gain, whereof themselves taste least by sea or shore, but like good souls contend evermore with any benefit their toil can bring. The fisher is well termed contents, is well termed contents true king. This emblem of the dolphin is the armory belonging to our brethren, and besides speaks somewhat of that creature's quality, by nature musical as hath been tried. 
poesy and music therefore thus do ride upon his back in sweet Arian shape, who by a dolphin thus did death escape. The King of Moors thus mounted and his train shows your affection to that company which league with you in love and doth contain the aptness of your correspondency on either side to hold inseparably. His Indian treasure liberally is thrown to make this beauteous heart the better known. This Lehman tree your honour may conceit more than I speak, because mysteriously some hidden secret thereon doth await known to yourself. It speaks ingeniously the character of your authority, figured in that fair bird fostering her brood, though with the dear expense of her own blood. Continual cares and many broken sleeps, heart-killing fears which wait on eminence, hard at the heels, and torturingly still keeps within the soul's imperious residence, as whips to afflict both hope and patience. These in the pelican are figured here, and these you hardly will avoid this year. But as the senses sit about the tree and show you how their virtues are supplied, still with fresh vigour, so no doubt will be your busiest troubles sweetly qualified by those five helps that hold up dignity, discretion, policy and providence, courage, correction, these bar all offence. Lastly, Look on a figure of that day when, by heaven's help and Walworth's happy hand, that swarm of rebels who fought all to sway and have both king and country at command, even in their height of pride I made them stand. And in my sovereign sight their eyes struck dead, their chiefest captain and commanding head. The rest of that base rout, dismayed thereby, and all tumultuous troubles calmly ceased, King Richard to requite true loyalty, his gracious favour presently expressed in royal manner, knighting me and the rest of Alderman, knighting me and the rest of Alderman that were in field with me. London till then had not that dignity. As I, so these, do represent the men knighted in field on Corpus Christi day. And as my dagger slew the rebel then, so to renown the deed, and I dare say, to honour London more, if more it may, the red cross in a silver field before had Walworth's dagger added to it more. And now, my lord, this goodly monument or chariot of triumphal victory, some shape in that day's honour doth present by heaven's protection of true majesty and beating down treason and mutiny, adorning all the thrones with those fair graces that ought about a king to have best places. Truth, virtue, honour, sober temperance, fortitude, zeal, equity, conscience, justice, authority, careful vigilance, peace, plenty, law, counsel, obedience, and discipline that whips all errors hence. These, as best pillars, do support this state and every kingdom else doth propagate. A blessed bachelor are you, my lord, by being your sacred sovereign's deputy in such state where all these do concord and truly do protect his majesty, figured in Richard's great authority. As Walworth then, so Lehman now may say, never had man a happier wedding day. And thus they uh, will present on to uh, St Paul's um, and then 
uh, there will be this speech at night as a farewell to my lord. So they will see him to his his door uh, at the end of the occasion. So this is Sir Simon Woolworth, his speech at night as a farewell. Phoebus hath hid his golden head in Thetis' lap, and now are spread the sable curtains of the night, our evening's purpose to delight. The twinkling tapers of the sky are turned to torches and apply their clearest radiance to convey our maiden bridegroom on his way home to his own abiding place. Our triumph's pomp shortens apace that could afford more time to spend, but gladly would no way offend. Your marriage rites sol solemnized bequeaths you to the bridal bed, where you and your chaste wife must rest. London, it seems, did like you best, although you are a bachelor, to be her husband for a year. Love her. Delight her. She's a bride, ne'er slept by such a husband's side, but once before. She hath had many, and you may prove as good as any have gone before you in this place. Twill be your brethren's joy and grace that fishmongers live still in fame and still renowned by your name. Their hearty love by me they send ye, and pray the hand of heaven defend ye in all your actions. May your fame crown still their ancient worthy name to all posterity. So, London's lord and virgin husband, in a word, old Walworth must to rest again. Good night to you and all your train. Yeah, uh, that, that has all the, the, the vibes of a drunken uh, uh, stag do night. Um, something really weird about uh, that. Um, yes, as be, has been noted in the chat, the uh, the, the, the Sir Simon uh, element is uh, is clearly wrong. Uh, so that's just uh, Sir William once again um, off, off to pop his clogs uh, again in a moment. Um, yeah, thoughts in the room on that? Uh, relatively brief, because we've got one more text, although not a very long one to do in a moment. Uh, Liza. Well, I was just thinking, um, the the conceit is the marriage of, uh, of, of Lemon or, or Lehman and London, but London has just been represented as a boy in the shape of an angel, so... Uh, that's, um, it's, it's odd because we've had London in pageants before we've had, indeed by Monday, I think we've had London represented as, as a, a woman, a lady, uh, not necessarily the poshest of ladies, not necessarily a, a fit bride for a Lord Mayor, but, but certainly, uh, female. Uh, but, but in this one, London's genius is definitely a dude. So... Um, well, look, London, London's genius is a different character to London, and London's genius is always male. So, but yes, you're right. I mean, the whole that that whole that whole passage is very strange, actually. Um, you know, if you start sort of unpicking it, you know, she's only had one husband before. You might not be as good as him. Uh, you know, it's just like oh, cringe. Um, <laughs> uh, and following on from this, the the speech uh, before, where you know, explaining. Uh, you know the what the pageants meant in in not necessarily the most exciting of terms as well you know at, at least that that speech has a certain dynamism to it even if it's a deeply awkward one uh helen yeah the, that the first speech is i, I mean it, it it's not e an easy read cold because you need to be not glancing a line ahead but a good three lines ahead in order to find out where the thought is going to end because the rhymes are very little help in this. He, he keeps on whizzing his sense all over the place. Um, on the subject of uh, the, um, the fact that Walworth isn't married, um, for a, a, a man running a business in London, uh, uh, one of the aldermen where whatever, not to be married would be a severe disadvantage. I mean, I've known aldermen not be appointed aldermen because they weren't married. And it was felt that there was no one to look after their household or run their business for them while they were aldermaning. Mm. 
Uh, any additional oh, thoughts, uh, Angela? Are you? Sorry. No, 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 Angela, do you jump in? Oh, I apologise, but I mean, like, kind of in the standard, you know, seven ages of man, getting married, really establishing a household is a, is a key feature, isn't it, of becoming really an adult. So it makes you wonder whether Lehman has already got really, really pots and pots and pots of money. And, uh, and he's clearly never going to get married. And so they're making a big play here for how he's married to London. So he better give all their, give her all his money. I can't help but feel there's some sort of... <laughs> he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty old. He's 60, 54, 54 plus 16, 70 um, at the time. Um, he lives on to 1632. So he's, God, he's 88 and he dies. Um, so I don't know. Beyond that, I don't know. I mean, he just, you know, he just distributed his money amongst the city, really. Mm. Uh, Liza. The, the wedding motif um, reminds me very much of the Doge of Venice and the ceremony of the Doge marrying the sea, uh, throwing a ring from the ducal barge uh, into the, into, in, into, I forget, the lagoon or the Grand Canal. Uh, any additional last thoughts on this particular pageant before we move on to for, uh, allow a year to pass? Um, I just wonder how he liked being called a maiden. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and we're, we're certain he was never married. He's not, he's not a widower. He's not... Nope. As we know. Excellent. Right. So that's it for the Fishmongers and uh, for a little bit uh, from Anthony Mundy. Uh, we are now changing years. We're changing playwrights. Jump forward. It is now October the 29th again, but it's now 1617. And we have a, uh, a, uh, a pageant written by uh, uh, Thomas Middleton. Uh, it's not very long. The document we have is very, very short. We do have some ancillary uh, material that uh, goes with it, uh, as we did with the other. We will endeavour to uh, post links to material that uh, you can look at online for all of these things. If they are available, we will uh, put them in the show notes. Um, but this is the Triumphs of Honour and Industry. And I'm going to ask Angela, could you just re read the front page bump, please? The Triumphs of Honour and Industry a solemnity performed through the city at confirmation and establishment of the Right Honourable George Bowles in the office of His Majesty's Lieutenant, the Lord Mayor of the famous City of London. Taking beginning at his Lordship's going and proceeding after his return from receiving the oath of mayoralty at Westminster on the morrow next after Simon and Jude's day, October the 29th, 1617. London, printed by Nicholas Oakes, 1617. And uh, yes, so what do we know about George Bowles um, and, uh, and uh, his uh, livery company? Uh, Bowles was another old man, actually. He was in his 70s as well. Oh, you know, relatively speaking, old man. Um, he, he, was very, he was a big investor in the Virginia company. Um, he part funded the Virginia plantations. Um, so he's, he's, a, he's a kind of big player in the city. Um, that's where his money went. And uh, what's the livery company for this one? Um, Grocers. Grocers. Ah, excellent. Yep. Oh, yes, it's coming up any second now. Yes, I see it. Um, OK, so um, Rachel, could you read? Could you be Thomas Middleton, please, uh, for the dedicatory uh, passage down to TM, please? To the worthy deserver of all the costs and triumphs which the noble society of grocers and bounteous measure bestow on him, the right honorable uh, George Bowles, Lord Mayor of the famous city of London, right honorable of the slightest labors and employments there may that virtue sometimes arise that may enlighten the best part of man, nor have these kinds of triumphs and idle relish, especially if they are especially if they be artfully accomplished under such an esteemed slightness may often lurk that fire that may shame the best perfection. For instance, 
what greater means for the imitation of virtue and nobleness can anywhere present itself with more alacrity to the beholder than the memorable fames of those worthies in the castle manifested by their echelons of arms, the only symbols of honor and antiquity, the honorable seat that is reserved. All men have hope that your justice and goodness will exact merit to the honor of which I commend your lordship's virtues remaining at your honor's service, TM. Yeah, Thomas Middleton there, um, setting out his stall to a degree. Any thoughts on that before we move forward? I'm not sure there's, there's an awful lot necessarily to say um, uh, on that particular bit of uh, bump. Uh, I, I'm, it's, uh, it's not leaping out at me as useful data in terms of uh, understanding how things go. Uh, so let's go into the uh, next few paragraphs. Uh, I'll go around the room. Eric. Angela Helen for the next uh, three uh, bits of text. Uh, we're gonna, if this one, he dances around between uh, describing things and giving his actual speeches. So this hopefully will give us a slightly tidier sense of uh, what's going on, but maybe it won't, we shall see. So um, Eric first, the triumphs of honor and industry. It hath been twice my fortune in short time to have employment for this noble society where I have always met with men of much understanding and no less bounty to whom cost appears but as a shadow. So there be fullness of content in the performance of the solemnity which that the world may judge of for whose pleasure and satisfaction custom hath yearly framed it. But chiefly for the honor of the city, it begins to present itself not without form and order which is required in the meanest employment. And now we have the first invention. Uh, passing that on to Angela. A company of Indians, attired according to the true nature of their country, seeming for the most part naked, are set at work in an island of growing spices, some planting nutmeg trees, some other spice trees of all kinds, some gathering the fruits, some making up bags of pepper, every one severally employed. These Indians are all active youths who ceasing in their labors dance about the trees, both to give content to themselves and the spectators. After this show of dancing Indians in the island follows triumphantly a rich personage presenting India, the seat of merchandise. This India sits on the top of an illustrious chariot on the one side of her sits traffic or merchandise, on the other side, industry, both fitted and adorned according to the property of their natures. Industry holding a golden ball in her hand, upon which stands a cupid, signifying that industry gets both wealth and love. And with her associate traffic or merchandise, who holds a globe in her hand knits love and peace amongst all nations, to the better expressing of which, if you give attention to industry that now sets forward to speak, it will be yours more exactly. Uh, Greg, if I could ask you to read the speech of industry uh, in the chat, in industry chariot. I was jealous of the flush, oh, sorry. I was jealous of the shattering of my grace, but that I know this is my time and place. One has not industry a noble friend in this assembly. Even the best extend their grace and love to me, joyed or amazed, who of true fame possessed, but I have raised and after added honours to his days. For industry is the lifeblood of praise. To rise without me is to steal to glory. And who so abject to leave such a story? It is as clear as light, as bright as truth. Fame waits their age from industry their youth. Behold this ball of gold, upon which stands a golden cupid wrought with curious hands. The mighty power of industry it shows that gets both wealth and love, which overflows with such a stream of amity and peace, not only to itself adding increase, but several nations where commerce abounds, taste the harmonious peace so sweetly sounds. For instance, let your gracious eyes be fixed upon a loy, true, 
they're so strangely mixed. Um, Greg, if you can actually continue with the next bit of text, please. And that you may take better note of their adornment, India, whose seat is the most eminent for her expression, holds in her hand a wedge of gold, traffic her associate, a globe, industry, a fair golden ball in her hand, upon which stands a golden cupid, fortune expressed with a silver wheel, success holding a painted ship in a haven, wealth a golden key where her heart lies, virtue bearing for her manifestation a silver shield, grace holding in her hand a book, perfection a crown of gold. Uh, right, so uh, we'll just pause there. That seemed to be uh, all the same uh, speech or, or not, and uh, I, I wasn't sure on that front. That's why I asked you to, to carry on. Um, it, uh, so I, I was a little confused there. So we've got a. This is this is where it all gets a little awkward. Uh, so we've got a show of dancing Indians in the island. That seems to be potentially a pageant. Uh, followed by um, a rich personage presenting India, uh, the seat of merchandise, uh, on an illustrious chariot, uh, and uh, who uh, uh, and on this chariot we've got industry, and who makes that speech? I think that sort of breaks down the action so far. There's no particular indication of where this is happening. We can probably assume that this is one end of Cheapside and it's about to make its way along. Um, details are a little scant. Um, thoughts about some of the issues that that's bringing up um, and uh, about, you know, we've, we've, Tracy's already mentioned uh, where this particular Lord Mayor is, uh, is invested and uh, what that may be saying as well. Um, thoughts uh helen they're certainly not going to be throwing spices out to the crowd they're far too expensive they did they did they did wow yeah they 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 they, they purchased quite a lot of um spices to specifically for the crowd for the pageants um in 1613 so i imagine they did it again a few mm. years later gosh that was generous <laughs> Yeah. Also, the, the 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 idea that the the base and ignorant natives of those parts who toil um, with the the cultivation of the spices are do so enormously happily mm. and dance to show their joy at being such useful parts of uh, international spice trade. Yeah, we we see the beginning of a uh, a very long living uh, narrative thread here uh, about yes, they're so happy, they're so happy with the 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 the, the toil that we we are uh, that the, we are uh, making money off. Uh, uh, Rachel, I think I saw her hand. Oh, sorry, trying to unmute. Um, no, I was going to ask like. It, if they were throwing out spices, I wonder if like people like coming like as the crowd would bring pots or pans or something to catch some of them and you know bring home or something like that. Uh, other thoughts? Okay, let's uh, let's dig a little deeper. We're coming up to some bits uh, in uh, in a mo. We're not quite there yet uh, in in French and Spanish. I wasn't actually going to ask people in the room to read the French and Spanish in the actual French and Spanish. There there is uh, there is an English translation that comes with it. And uh, but uh, if uh, if if people feel game, um, you can. Uh, as someone nodded. Liza, Liza feels game uh, for the French at least. Uh, who's who's I'm, I'm game for French and Rachel speaks Spanish. Okay, so well, we're gonna we're gonna dive into that. I won't ask you to read any of the next paragraph. Uh, the next paragraph, then I'll ask Greg. Could you read the uh, the uh, the next? Oh no, you just asked you to read. Um, oh, Rob, can uh, I just Angela. can I just drop in a sec? Oh please, please do. Sorry, uh, just just checking um, Bacino's account of the show. Um, but anyway, the first stages made their appearance. The harness to griffins ridden by lads in silk liveries. Others followed drawn by lions and camels and other large animals, laden with bales from which the lads took sundry confections, sugar, nutmegs, dates and ginger, throwing them among the populace. Mm -hmm. There you go. He was there. That's what they did. 
Right. So was it camels and uh, and what was there? Lions, camels, and other large animals. That's good to I see. Think the mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, nice to see them unpacked again for another another year. Uh, okay, Angela. Actually, if I could ask you to read the next uh, uh, paragraph, and then I will hand the Frenchman to Liza and the Spaniard uh, to uh, to uh, Rachel, and anything in between that needs explicating, I will I will jump in for. At which words the pageant of several nations, which is purposely planted near the sound of the words, moves with a kind of affectionate joy, both at the honour of the day's triumph and the prosperity of love, which by the virtue of traffic is likely ever to continue, and for good omen of the everlasting continuance of it, on the top of this curious and triumphant pageant, shoots up a laurel tree, the leaves spotted with gold, about which sit six celestial figures presenting peace, prosperity, love, unity, plenty, and fidelity. Peace holding a branch of palm, prosperity, a laurel, love, two joint hands, unity, two turtles, plenty holding fruits, fidelity, a silver anchor. But before I entered so far, I should have shown you the zeal and love of the Frenchman and Spaniard, which now I hope will not appear unseasonably, who not content with a silent joy like the rest of the nations, have a thirst to utter their gladness, though understood of a small number, which is this. The short speech delivered by the Frenchman in French. La multitude m'ayant monté sur ce haut lieu pour contempler le glorieux triomphe de cette journée, le voit qu'en quelque sorte la noble dignité de la très honorable société des grossiers y est représentée, dont rejouissant par-dessus tous, le leur souhaite et à Monseigneur le Maire le comble de toute noble et heureuse fortune. Uh, the same in English. It is my joy, chiefly, and I stand for thousands, to see the glory of this triumphant day which, in some measure, requites the noble worthiness of the honourable society of grocers, to whom, and to my Lord Mayor, I, I wish all good successes. This Frenchman no sooner sets a period to his speech, but the Spaniard, in zeal as virtuous as he, utters himself to the purpose of these words, and this is the verdict from the Spanish jury. Ningunas de todos estas naciones conciben mejor y verdad y ver dadera alegría en este triunfante y glorioso día que yo no ninguna de todos ellas porque ahora que me parece que son tan ricas es senal que los de me de, de mi nación en tratan, tratando Con ellas receberán mayor pro, pro I don't know if this is Middle English spelling of Spanish, but I'll, I'll try this. Proeco, proveco prove, prove de ellas al mi senor, senor don mayor, don mayor todos buenas y dichosas fortunas y a los de la honorada compañía de especicros dichoso, dichosos deseos y así Dios guarde a mi señor don mayor y rogo a Dios que todo el año si siguiente pueda ser tan dichoso como esta entrada suya a la digma, digma, de, digma de, de la señora, guarde Dios a su señoria. The same in English. None of all these nations conceive more true joy at this triumphant day than myself. To my Lord, Mayor, all fair and noble fortunes, and to the worthy society of grocers, all happy wishes, and I pray heaven 
that all the year following may be as happy and successful as this first entrance to your dignity. This expression of their joy and love having spent itself, I know you cannot part contented without their several inscriptions. Now the favor and help must be in you to conceive our breadth and limits and not to think we can in these customary bounds comprehend all the nations, but so many as shall serve to give content to the understander which thus produce themselves. Uh, and we, yes, uh, that last bit, uh, is that part of the, uh, the Spaniard speech or is that uh, just w Middleton being really enthusiastic about um, uh, the stuff he's about to dis uh, describe, uh, the several inscriptions? The, the, set, the, the naming of the people isn't a no, part the, of- No, this expression of their joy and love having spent itself, is that, uh, is that part of the uh, Spaniard speech or was that uh, uh, the next paragraph? I think it's it, the next paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, it sounds yeah. like the next paragraph. Yeah, so um, you, there's- do you, hear, do you want to hear what the actor performing the Spaniard did on the day? Oh, yes, please. We actually have a bit of improvisation here going on. All the large and handsome stages followed, one of which I was told represented the religion of the Indians, the sun shining aloft in the midst of other figures. On another stage was a fine castle, while a third bore a beautiful ship, supposed to be just returned from the Indies with its crew and cargo. Other stages bore symbols of co commerce or the nations which traded with India. Among the figures represented was a Spaniard, wonderfully true to life, who imitated the gestures of that nation perfectly. This, remember, this is a Venetian saying this. Um, he wore small black mustachios, and a hat and cape in the Spanish fashion with a ruff around his neck and others around his wrists, nine inches deep. He kept hitting his hands right and left, but especially to the Spanish ambassador, who was a short distance from us, in such wise as to elicit roars of laughter from the multitude. Hilarious. <laughs> Remember how popular the Spanish were in London? Mm. Yeah. Like foreigner. So, yes, yeah, so this is a uh, pageant of several nations. Uh, there's a laurel tree uh, which pops up, shoots up a laurel tree, uh, leaves spotted with gold. Uh, there are six celestial figures. Um, um, there's, uh, but, but, but it's like he's telling this story that he's, I got so far, I forgot to mention the Frenchman and the Spaniard. I quite like it, that, that the, the way Middleton is describing this of just like he's out of breath going, oh, and then there's this bit. It's, 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 it's quite nice. And it sort of is picked up by the, that next bit of, um, I cannot part contented without their several, uh, describing those several inscriptions. So there's an Englishman, a Frenchman, an Irishman, a Spaniard, a Turk, a Jew, a Dane, a Polander, a Barbarian, a Russian or Muscovian. Um, and I love this line. Uh, this fully expressed, I arrived now at that part of triumph which my desire ever hastened to come to, this castle of fame or honour, which industry brings her sons unto in their reverend ages. It's just going, this is the best bit. This is a bit I, I really like. Uh, it's coming up now. So we have another pageant uh, coming up, another part of the, uh, the event, which is a castle. Um, so I will ask Helen if you can read the first paragraph, uh, Eric if you can read the next, and then uh, then we'll get to some dialogue uh, in a moment. In the front of this castle, reward and industry decked in bright robes, keep a seat between them for him whom the day's honour is dedicated, showing how many worthy son of the city and of the same society, have by their truth, desert and industry come to the like honour before him, where on a sudden is shown divers of the same right worshipful society of grocers, manifested both by their good government in their times, as also by their escutcheons of arms, as an example and encouragement to all virtuous and industrious deservers in time to come. And in honor of antiquity is shown that ancient and memorable worthy of the grocer's company, Andrew Bockrell, who was mayor of London the 16th year of Henry III, 1231, and continued so mayor seven years together. 
Likewise, for the greater honor of the company, is also shown in this castle of fame, the noble Alain de la Zouche, uh, grocer who was mayor of London the two and fiftieth year of the same Henry the Third, which Alain de la Zouche, for his good government in the time of his mayoralty, was by the said king Henry the Third, made both a baron of this realm and Lord Chief Justice of England. Also, that famous worthy Sir Thomas Knowles grocer, twice mayor of this honorable city, which Sir Thomas begun at, one, at his own charge, that famous building of Guildhall in London and other memorable works, both in the city and in his own company, so much worthiness being the luster of this castle, and all indeed to be the imitation of the beholder. Uh, oh, my so lord goodness. no sooner approaches, but reward uh, a partner with justice in keeping that seat of honour, as overjoyed at the sight of him, appears too free and forward in the resignation. I'll ask uh, Rachel if you could read reward and Greg to be justice as we rattle towards the end. Liza, I'm going to ask you to take on the bulk of the text that follows, please. Whoop, whoop. Welcome to fame's bright castle. Take thy place. The seat's reserved to do thy virtue's grace. True, but not yet to be possessed. Hear me, justice must flow through him before that be great works of grace must be required and done. Before the honour of this seat be won, a whole year's reverent care in righting wrongs and guarding innocence from malicious tongues must be employed in virtue's sacred right before this place be filled with tis meat. Before this place be filled, tis no mean fight that wins this palm, truth and a virtuous care of the oppressed. The, those the lodestones are that will against envy's power draw him forth to take this merit in this seat of worth, where all the memorable worthies shine in works of brightness, able to refine all the beholders' minds and strike new fire to kindle an industrious desire to imitate their actions and their fame, which to this castle adds that glorious name wherefore reward, free as the air or light, there must be merit or our works not right. If there were any, if there were any error, twas my love. And if it be a fault to be too free, reward commits but one such heresy. Howe'er, I know your worth will so extend, your fame will fill this seat at 12 months end. About this castle of fame are placed many honorable figures as truth, antiquity, harmony, fame, desert, good works. On the top of the castle, irony, on the top of the castle, honor, uh, religion, piety, commiseration, the works of those whose memories shine in this castle. If you look upon truth first, you shall find her properly expressed, holding in her right hand a sun, in the other a fan of stars, antiquity with a scroll in her hand as keeper of honor's records, harmony holding a golden lute and fame not without her silver trumpet, for dessert, uh, tis glorious through her own brightness, but holds nothing. Good works expressed with a college or hospital. On top of the castle, honor manifested by a fair star in his hand, religion with a temple on her head, a piety with an altar, commiseration with a melting or burning heart. And not to have our speakers forgotten, reward and justice, with whom we entered this part of the triumph, reward, holding a wreath of gold ready for a deserver, and justice furnished with her sword and balance. All this service is performed before the feast, some in Paul's churchyard, some in Cheapside, at which place the whole triumph meets both castle and island, that gave delight upon the water, and now, as duty binds me, I commend my lord and his right honorable guests to the solemn pleasure of the feast, from whence I presume all epicurism is banished. For where honor is master of the feast, moderation and gravity are always attendants. The feast being ended at Guildhall, my lord, as yearly custom invites him, goes accompanied with the triumph towards St. Paul's to perform the noble and reverend ceremonies which divine antiquity virtuously ordained. 
and is no less than faithfully observed, which is no mean luster to the city. Holy service and ceremonies accomplished, he returns by torchlight to his own house, the whole triumph placed in comely order before him, and at the entrance of his gate, honor, a glorious person from the top of the castle, gives life to these following words. The speech of honor from the top of the castle at the entrance of my Lord Mayor's gate. There is no human glory or renown, but have their evening and their sure sun setting, which shows that we should upward seek our crown and make but use of time our hopes bettering. So to be truly mindful of our own is to perform all parts of good in one and close this triumph day. The close of this triumphant day is come, and honour stays to bid you welcome home. All I desire for my grace and good is but to be remembered in your blood, with honour to accomplish the fair time which power hath put into your hands, a crime as great as ever came into sin's band, I do entitle a too sparing hand. Nothing deads honour more than to behold plenty cooped up and bounty faint and cold, which ought to be the free life of the year. For bounty was ordained to make that clear, which is the light of goodness and of fame and puts by honour from the cloud of shame. Great cost and love hath nobly been bestowed upon thy triumph, which this day hath showed. Embrace them in thy heart, till times afford fuller expression in one absolute word. All the content that ever made man blessed, this triumph done, make a triumphant breast. No sooner the speech is ended, but the triumph is dissolved, and not possible to scape the hands of the defacer. Things that, for their quaintness, I dare so far commend them, have not been usually seen through the city. The credit of which workmanship I must justly lay upon the deserts of Mr. Roland Bucket, uh, or Bouquet, depending on your opinion, uh, chief master of the work, yet not forgetting the faithful care and industry of my well-approved friend, Master Henry Wilde and Master Jacob Challoner are partners in the business. The season cuts me off, and after this day's troubling, trouble, I am as willing to take my rest. End credits, close scene. Um, yeah, we, the time is running on, so I, I did just let us read that pretty much uh, through. Um, partly because we have actually a relatively small amount of data coming from this particular uh, document. We've got other uh, material that, to say, links will be available to, uh, uh, some of which has been uh, read out and which maybe more will occur. We get this little moment to, after we've talked about this castle at great length. This seems to be that sort of stacked thing of uh of 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 peoples um uh, uh we have a brief note of the order of service in here uh all this service is performed before the feast some in paul's charge some in cheapside uh which point the whole triumph meets both castle and island that gave the light upon the water so that we we've, we've known pageants to sort of start and head down to the waterside and you know and 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 be about and then end up later on so uh that we have had pageants moving themselves around uh so that they get the maximum usage throughout the course of the day so maybe that's referring to that maybe it's not maybe i'm just talking nonsense that's, who knows that's very much the impression you get from Bassino actually because he's obviously static and they're all coming past him one by one. So, you know, regardless of where they were originally located for the speeches and so on, they do all end up in the kind of convoy. Mm. Yes, and at the very end, you know, the, the, this idea that they're all sort of parked in a, in a row <laughs> <laughs> outside the Lord Mayor's, um, uh, you know, on his way home. Uh, <laughs> and he gets this speech there. I, uh, yeah. Uh, thoughts from the room about this particular pageant. Is there any more material, uh, Tracy, that we think uh, might be good to throw in at this point? 
Um, we will examine other documents, perhaps in more detail yeah, later. I've just put the link up to to the Sino. Um, it's towards the bottom of the page. Um, this is this is one of the shows that's quite well, relatively speaking, quite well discussed because people have kind of focused in on the depiction of the Indians and trade and so on. Um, it's obviously not unique in that respect, but there's quite a bit of commentary on this one, um, certainly in recent years. Just to kind of note um, that Chaloner and Wilde are both painter stainers and Chaloner was actually one of the very, very highly regarded Herald painter as well. He came down from Cheshire. Um, so he's got, again, Bucket, as I said before, was the master of the company. So he's got a, a good team with him then. Mm. And yes, making sure you've got something that looks uh, visually appealing is, is the order of business, really. Um, are we here for the speeches? Well, maybe we are. Um, we want to see animals uh, and things. Uh, Angela. I'm just struck once more about the lack of song. Or uh, Now, I know that there was some dancing earlier, um, so I don't know whether that, what music there was with that, but it's just kind of very interesting to see this, this um, absence of singing. Mm. We've had pageants where we've had clearly marked songs or they're singing along at this point. Um, certainly, obviously, we, 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 you know, we've had trumpets and, uh, and, and other musical cues as part of the procession. They're probably uh, some of them are still there. Um, but yeah, there's no there's no indications uh, in this document uh, as to what music might have been happening. Bacino says that the, um, the pageant of the, the Moors, the pastoral couple with fifes, so one dressed entirely in red feathers, while the other represented a tiger being wrapped in the animal skin. We don't get that from the text. Um, this couple played the part of man and wife, performing on their instruments in the Indian fashion. The children danced all the while. I don't know what the Indian fashion is, but... Yes, I mean, heaven help us all, really, isn't it? Oh, my um, God knows what they, what they meant by India, really. It could have been a variety of different places. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Rachel? I, I, are they, by Indians, do they mean Native Americans? Because... Um, they have the Spaniard and the Frenchman in that, that, and they're, you know, they were having colonies over there and they were doing stuff in North America too. It's what well, the spices came from what were then regarded as the, the East Indies. Um, so it's, it's often really hard to tell. Sometimes you get characters who are talking about being from the Spice Islands, but are clearly dressed in kind of American Indian or Native American Indian costume or Central American Indian costume. So that, that it's all very confused. Um, you know, most the average Londoner probably has no idea where these people are from. Uh, yeah, other thoughts from the room? Um, I say a relative paucity of, uh, of data, of uh, the, the, the additional data that we, we really need to look at in, in more detail uh, is not what we're reading today, sadly. Eric, then Helen. Well, this writer seems, uh, Middleton, I mean, seems a lot more sort of chipper about the pageant compared to Monday, <laughs> who keeps making comments about, oh, yes, and they got this wrong as well, and this, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, whereas, I don't know, Middleton seems a lot more sort of upbeat, like, oh, yes, I dare talk about the beauty of this, and uh, the sort of, and just the language is a lot more, a lot different. Yeah, he's really excited about the inscriptions. Uh, you know, he's really excited. He's, he's very Tiggerish in this document, isn't he? <laughs> Which is not, not really how I think of Middleton at all. Um, Helen. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Eric. I found that I found the language a lot easier than uh, the previous one, uh, than, than the Monday. Um, I was quite interested in that last speech, which was saying, all this, all this honor, all this is absolutely nothing without generosity. Give, give to London, give to me maybe. But he, he does go on at enormous length about how important it is to be open-handed. Mm. I wondered if, I mean, it, it's possible that this was because the guy wasn't noted for his open-handedness or I don't know what it is. Um, well, that, that's that's probably the kind of standard reference to the Lord Mayor being expected to have an open house for the duration of his term. And I think I did look at a kind of bossy biography of Bells earlier on, and apparently he was renowned for being very hospitable. Oh, good, good, good. So it's praise then rather than, uh, yes. 
instruction. Yeah. It's an expectation, and we will see when we get to 18, 18, 16, 20 that this kind of broke the Lord Mayor that year. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Rachel. Um, I don't know. I was just, th this, just going to say that this one is interesting because it uh, it's just talking so much about, you know, I think things that are ha that were happening over here, like on in North America and South America and what's going on over there, because it, I think there's a lot in here that's just interesting to me because there's so many things that there that as a country and as a continent and continents that a lot of this stuff that they're talking about um in terms of trade i think still affects us so socially um and then also i was gonna say i've, I've never seen like some of this some of the spelling for spanish that's in here so i don't so like i guess that's the the way that so, some some words used to be spelled or some yeah hmm yeah, so I, I I can't comment on 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 the spelling of the Spanish, uh, but in, certainly in terms of uh, that, there, there are a lot of balls set rolling uh, at, at at this sort of time. Uh, certain ideas and attitudes that are, are starting to uh, uh, be embedded, um, and uh, and there are there are elements of that in here, uh, in in ways that uh, that are, are much more apparent um, because in part of what this is doing and what this is talking about, you know. These are all, you know, livery companies are interested. They're interested in trade. They're interested in, in, in money and they're interested in, uh, you know, where these things come from. Um, and so there's a celebration of that. But there's also uh, how they depict that is, uh, is, um, is, yeah, it's, it's a problem uh, at times. Um, as it's it's uh, one, one person's celebration is not always somebody else's, uh, he said. Dancing around that. Um, uh, any additional thoughts before I close the session? We've 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 rushed slightly through this second one. I feel that uh, um, maybe we will come back to the other source material. Maybe just dipping into this particular text uh, as well, the, trying to merge them a bit more together um, as as we go. Because uh, uh, we will be returning to uh, many of these texts again, uh, especially as we're looking for ways of uh, producing. Uh, properly uh, produced uh, uh, versions of these uh, across different mediums uh, in the future, which is sort of what we do. Uh, so uh, uh, the more material, the merrier uh, as we go forward. Uh, any final thoughts anyone wants to throw in? No. So that is it from these two Lord Mayor's shows for this session, uh, 16, 16, 16, 17. We hope that uh, we will be uh, coming back to some more next week uh scheduled to be devised um but so we hopefully will be looking at 16 18 19 uh in the next session on this as and when it comes thanks to all the wonderful readers in the room thank you and goodbye <laughs>